Welcome into Stone Cold Strohs. I'm Brandon Strange with Charlie Flillo and Josh Jordan. Follow them on X at Flillo and at Josh Jordan 975 and read their work on sportsmap.com. We invite you to please click like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, click that bell for notifications so you know as soon as new content drops, all those things really do help us grow the channel. And if you prefer listening to your podcast, we're on all your favorite podcast apps. And if you're one of those crazy Texans fans, the three of us are doing live reactions following every game this season for our Texans on tap podcast. If you missed our breakdowns of Bears Texans, you can go find that on our other YouTube channel, Sports Map Texans, or in audio form, again, on all your favorite podcast apps. Just search Texans on tap, but you know, do that after you've listen to this podcast guys we're grinding down to the final dozen or so games remaining in the season and it has been a grind uh, following a sweep of the angels over the weekend the astros maintain that four and a half game lead over seattle you know as we record this seattle takes two of or excuse me three of four from texas over the weekend so thanks for absolutely nothing rangers um seattle is seven and three over their last 10 but are seemingly running out of time for the division although they are only two and a half games back of the backsliding twins for that final wild card spot who Houston will face in a, a wild card series should the playoffs start today. Um, so Seattle's remaining record Yankees or remaining schedule, I should say uh, Yankees at home. Uh, they travel to Texas and then Houston and then end at home versus that gritty ace team. Houston's at San Diego four at home versus the angels followed by Mariners at home and then uh, ending with a series at Cleveland. So gents, uh, with all that said, all that context put into place, what are your thoughts on the current uh, Astros positioning and how these final two weeks play out? The time honored baseball axiom, 162, 162 games is a marathon, not a sprint. We're down to the sprint. And if this is the 100 meters, the Astros have a 10 meter head start, which in a 100 meter race is a lot. Great collapses in baseball history have occurred within a two week span of time. It would take a collapse now for the Astros not to win the division, headed by losing all three games to the Mariners next week. If Seattle was to come to Minute Maid Park and sweep, okay, that cuts the lead from four and a half to one and a half, the before and after games in the schedule. The flaming advantage. Inferno advantage the Astros has the four more games with the Angels. Nothing, of course, guaranteed in one little series. Astros last September, the Wobegon A's and Royals, et cetera, et cetera. But as the Astros took out the trash in Anaheim over the weekend, I mean, you'd think at bare minimum, absolute bare minimum, a split of four with the Angels, likely at least three out of four with the Angels, and time is melting away on the Mariners. The Astros at San Diego, which absolutely could be a World Series preview. Two wildcard teams made it last year. Rangers and Diamondbacks had to survive the wildcard round. Uh, Astros, best record in the American League since the All-Star break. Padres, best record by far relative to the Astros and by a little bit over the Diamondbacks in all Major League Baseball uh, since the All-Star break. But while the Astros are at San Diego, say the Padres put them on it. Here we go again, Astros fans. Let's go, Yankees. Mm. But the Yankees at Seattle, right? So unless Seattle has a phenomenal, phenomenal finishing kick, handling the Yankees, and then coming and doing damage uh, at Minute Maid Park, in which case you just have to tip the caps to Seattle. But a four and a half game lead within the Astros case, just 13 games to go. They open the week equidistant. No one thinks, other than a baseball in Houston, catastrophe in Seattle, miracle. No one thinks the Astros aren't going to win the American League West at this point. Well, they're four and a half ahead of Seattle. They're four and a half behind Cleveland. If clinging to hope, maybe, maybe they can avoid that best of three wild card. Just as the Mariners have a chance to sweep three here, the Astros have a chance to sweep three at Cleveland. But that series probably, probably will be rendered moot, but probably doesn't mean definitely. So the Astros still have a little work to do. But even if the Astros falter badly, Seattle's still going to have to be just scintillating these last two weeks to overtake the Astros. Yeah, I, you know, for me, it's about pitching in baseball. And I like what the Astros have. You know, I look at this series coming up against the Padres and you know, Arigetti, Brown and, and Fromber. You feel pretty good about those guys, even though the, the Padres are they're throwing out some really good arms against you as well. So with having that lead, having the pitching, I I like having Kyle Tucker starting to look more like Kyle Tucker. I saw him run from first to third. I was like, OK, that looks pretty good. We've seen him hit some uh, home run now. 
So I'm feeling good about this team. And, and Blanco came out, had another nice performance. It's it's good to see that he can he can miss a few starts every now and then to, to save the arm and then come out and have a really nice performance, given it was against the Angels. But we saw how hard Verlander worked against the Angels. So you'll take it when you can get it. I, I feel like they're in a good spot. It looks like maybe we dodged a bullet there with Altuve. That really concerned me. I was like, oh, no, is that another ab injury and there's only a couple weeks left in the season we know the astros are so uh not exactly the most forthcoming about injuries so that had me concerned it's good to see that he didn't really miss a beat he's back out there you know it's four and a half it feels pretty comfortable but we've seen this with the astros they can go and sweep the royals and then go get swept by the the reds and then look bad for a couple games against the a's and then come out and sweep the angels they're very streaky so and they seem to play against the better teams better than they do against the poorer teams. So I think if they can just kind of tread water, keep piling up wins here, I feel pretty confident that that they're going to come away with the division. Simple math. If the Astros close going just five and eight over these 13 games, the Mariners have to go nine and three in their last 12 to catch the Astros and the Mariners would then win the tiebreaker because they'd certainly have to win at least one of the games at Minimate Park if they're going to reel in a four and a half game deficit over just two weeks period of time. So could the Astros stumble and bumble to a five and eight close? Of course they could. Could the Mariners add to their seven and three last 10 games, nine and three? Of course they could. Neither would be uh, an, an unspeakably impossible result. But for the parlay of both the Astros woo, to do that and the Mariners woo, to surge, uh, I wouldn't want to put any money on that at the the paramutual window. Uh, but you know, if you want to if you want to be doom and gloom or you know look into the barrel and and not blink, a few years ago the Mets led the Phillies by seven games with seventeen games to go. Blow it, blow it. Uh, the most famous collapse in baseball history, nineteen sixty four Phillies had a six game lead with twelve games to go. Blew it. So there is precedent, but it's not like there's a long list of precedent. There's no such thing as an external jinx. If so, I'd use the powers in much better ways. The Astros are going to win this division. Josh, it has been an up down, up and down season, but as you mentioned, pitching has been king. Uh, the offense has been very hit or miss, but for September, Jose Altuve hitting 378 with a 973 OPS, Jordan Alvarez, 286 with a 1 dot OPS, Yiner Diaz, 354 with an 855 OPS, Kyle Tucker, since returning, hitting 300 with a 900 OPS. Welcome back, Kyle Tucker. Um, Alex Bregman, on the other hand, uh, you know, we look, we know he's uh, he's banged up with that elbow after hitting 303 with a 947 OPS in August. Now just 194 batting average with a sub 700 OPS. You were uh, warned August you, Bregman every year and then September boom, boom, boom. Yeah. was hoping the downtime in August. Right. We asked, could he roll August Bregman over to September? Not so far. Maybe he's saving it for the final final finish. In fairness, though, he is dealing with that gimpy elbow, and so he is trying to power through that. Look, we know the Astros are streaky, but how much does this consistency – and look, these guys also have had great seasons as well, Altuve, Jordan, Diaz, and and uh, Tucker when he's been healthy. These guys, So it's not just about a hot month for these guys, but you do, uh, you, you do feel some optimism that these guys are hitting – uh, as you're going into this final stretch. So, you know, now that you're getting that consistency from these top guys with Bregman notwithstanding, what's your optimism level now about Houston's chances down the stretch into the postseason with this performance and production? If you're an Astros fan, there's no reason not to be optimistic. Right? What they did in 2017, 2022, even the years just, just going to the ALC, none, none of it matters now. Right? That guys are hot and getting healthy now. Game one, two weeks from Tuesday of the best of three, none of that matters. So the inconsistency, there's no reason to worry about it. You're just going to go out and see what happens. 2022, Jose Altuve was a lot better player than 2024, Jose Altuve. And he began the postseason 0 for 25. Uh, we've talked before about how Jeremy Pena has really made no progress as an offensive player from his rookie season to now nearing the end of his third season. But when the lights flicked on in the 2022 postseason, he turned into some combination of prime Cal Ripken and Hannes Wagner. So in the short run, it just doesn't matter. Obviously, the Astros lineup remains 
very, very much top heavy. Well, most lineups are, though the Astros from six down, it's well below average. But it doesn't mean someone can't bubble to the surface. I mean, Jason Hayward hasn't done a whole lot overall, but he's put in a couple of big time hits. Ben Gamble down now, but when he first joined the Astros, made a couple of major contributions. Uh, John Singleton in one game, if he has an impact swing in the playoffs, it can help turn a series. So especially since the Astros quite likely are going to be in that best of three, the form chart means nothing. Who's a hot pitcher means nothing because you're going to have one start in that series. So what, uh, you know, the, the water finds its level over six months goes completely out the window when your season's about three days or five days or seven days. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to hit on, too. It was Jason Hayward's, you know, in Singleton, like Charlie mentioned. And it's just nice to have those. And it's unfortunate. Chaz McCormick finally starts looking like maybe he's figuring it out a little bit. And then he has that injury and looks like he'll be out for the rest of the regular season. So sometimes you have to lean on these other guys. And I think Dana Brown's done a good job of just picking up some guys, seeing what they have and, and letting them roll out there and make a contribution with Hayward, too, just with. You know, who knows? I know he's not going to be a regular contributor, but guys can get hot and they can sustain it as you go down the stretch and into the postseason. It, it's about confidence. And, you know, there's a reason he was released, but he's doing a good job in the limited work he's getting. And, and I'm like what I'm seeing from Singleton. We're seeing Diaz at first base and Caratini at first base. They're really kind of moving that around. I have to say, though, at least recently, I know the advanced stats won't won't say this, but Singleton's made some nice plays at first base, some big scoops lately. He's played a lot better than than I anticipated. So uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of when the games really, really get to crunch time, who's going to be playing first base on most days? You know, the pitching success of Houston has been well documented since May uh, this season. Verlander has not been a part of that success story. Even before his last IL stint, he just was not having a great season. Uh, Verlander, since his return, the team is one and four. Now, granted, they only scored three runs in his first three games. So, you know, you have to, you know, leverage that a little bit, but he's got an 834 ERA. Uh, since his return with a batting average against a 320 and an 854 OPS against with only five strikeouts over his last three appearances. Now, just for reference, Renel Blanco has averaged five strikeouts in his last five appearances. One of those was just two innings in relief. So in his last start, JB only gave up uh, two earned runs over five innings pitched, but it was against a team with a third lowest uh, team OPS in the league. Verlander admitted that his outs were tough. However, he seemed to have better control over his secondary pitch, pitches. Now, despite Dana Brown's comments about the back of JV's baseball card, uh, what does your gut, I know, I, I, for those listening, Josh is nodding his head uh, in disbelief, but despite those comments, what does your gut tell you about Justin Verlander making a postseason roster with this team? As precursor, Dana Brown, who all in all has had a very good year. I'm not saying he's a finalist for executive of the year, but you look at move by move, Dana Brown's had a solid season given the hand that he was played to uh, charged with playing, given payroll, Abreu, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he sounded ridiculous with the Verlander stuff. Starting with Dana, you're going to trot out the line you used and saying, Jose Abreu, look at the back of his baseball card. He's going to get it going. So uh, we all can have verbal missteps, but Dana Brown rhymed with clown uh, on that one. At this point, and I'm really not sure how it can change, Justin Verlander should get zero consideration to be in the Astros postseason rotation. This is not the Oscars where they give out that Lifetime Achievement Award. Recency bias, that doesn't favor Verlander either. Right? He was fortunate to get out of the first inning against the AAA Angels with just the two runs allowed and credit to him for grinding through the another four innings. But again, he threw his 80th pitch in the fourth inning or the first pitch of the fifth inning in the game. And if you're in that best of three after Fromber and Brown, Brown or Fromber, there is just no justification for Justin Verlander ahead of Kikuchi. Um, Aragetti, let's see what he does over his final couple starts. And you mentioned the X factor in this Ronel Blanco. Uh, second wind and recent performance. Okay, his start was against the Angels also, 
Well, he dominated the Angels lineup versus which Verlander scuffled. So I just don't see how, frankly, you even include Verlander on the playoff roster because you're not going to want to use him out of the bullpen ahead of Blanco if you're going to someone in inning five or, or inning six. And if you're thinking, well, you're going to conserve Blanco to be a starter, then you have Kikuchi and Aragetti in the bullpen. So it's absolutely no disrespect to surefire Hall of Famer Justin Verlander and all he's accomplished. But we're playing in the here and now, living in the here and now, the 2024 Astros trying to make an eighth straight ALCS appearance. And I just see no credible argument to the idea that Justin Verlander deserves an essential role in that going into this postseason. No, it, the Dana Brown thing just drives me up the wall. It's like, I like you, Dana Brown. Don't do this. Don't say this stuff. Like, why would you remind your fan base of one of your biggest misses and when you guys look completely ridiculous? Why would you bring that up as something you would point to? Like, hey, scoreboard, uh, you lost. Why would you point at the scoreboard when you lost? It makes zero sense. I, I wrote an article about it. I was just like, it's not that hard with Verlander. All you have, to, you don't have to go back to this back of the baseball card garbage. All you have to say is he's Justin Verlander. We have confidence in him. There's just, you know, still some time left in the season where we'll see where he's at when we have to make that decision. That's all you have to say. You don't have to do back of the baseball card and all this nonsense. It, it just it's insulting to the fan base. And the other thing that bothers me is Verlander's velocity is just so up and down. When Dana Brown made those comments, he was like, oh, I'd be a lot more concerned if Verlander wasn't you know regularly hitting 97 miles an hour. You know, and then I saw him in his most recent start. His fastball was more around 93. So that isn't like his fastball isn't sitting at 97 miles an hour. Every now and then he could he can hump it up to that, but that's just not where he's at right now. And that could be mechanical, it could be age, it could be a combination of all these things. But it, it's very clear that, that Verlander is your sixth best starter in the rotation right now. And I, I just don't see I just don't think there's enough time for him to figure it out. Now they're gonna give him every chance to do it. But but they kind of have to give lip service to that a little bit. He's a future Hall of Famer. I get it. And But I think at the end of the day, Verlander's just not one of your best options, and they're going to have to go with somebody else. And that's okay, because that's the good news is they have a lot of other really good options. We're not psychologists, but on Stone Cold Strohs, we may occasionally try a little bit to play them. What Dana Brown said actually was insulting to Justin Verlander. I mean, here's a cookie, Justin. Let me pat you on the head. We all know you stink right now. And we understand you're 41 and coming off major injuries, but everything's just fine. And you're humming at 97 and look at the back of your baseball card. If Verlander heard that, I'm sure at least to himself, he chuckled that, well, I appreciate the respect you're showing me, but frankly, you're just shining a light on how silly what you said is. Yeah. And by the way, you can read Josh's column about those comments on sportsmap.com. So make sure you bookmark that in your browser so you can come back to sportsmap.com regularly. And look, Charlie, to, to JB's credit, uh, he has been very transparent and open with his struggles. So oh, he's nice. not trotting out those, you know, uh, tired lines. And I'm only half kidding when I say Astros fans should consider a petition that the that Houston's front office should stop telling us about the backs of baseball cards because I don't know how what good that does anyone uh, outside of well I don't want to say it but let's just say that doesn't do anyone any good uh, we'll we'll wrap it here that's that's part one of Stone Cold Strohs we'll have another video dropping on Tuesday we're going to dig into some potential postseason matchups for Houston so keep an eye out for that and until then go Strohs. Mm -hmm.